some of the ideas that I write about are are, are kind of known. Okay, um, for example, we need to uh, internalize costs that are externalized onto the environment. Part of the worldview of separation is that nature is this thing out there, and so we can you know use it as a limitless depository of our wastes. Uh, as we understand that what we do unto the other, all, we so also do unto ourselves. That's kind of the new golden rule. Um, we want to reflect that understanding in our economic system. So that would mean things like green taxes, um, sh a shift of taxation away from income and away from sales onto pollution and resource extraction, which means that so, which basically we're changing the story of value. We're changing the agreements about what's valuable and, and infusing those agreements into our money system so that it becomes very expensive to pollute so that, that uh, objects that are made without polluting and without taking new resources that are made maybe from recycled things or reused things, all of a sudden these have an economic advantage. So the price reflects our values. Today, prices don't reflect our values. You can make something by doing the most horrible things to indigenous cultures, to third world countries, to rainforests, to the water table, yet that thing is still very cheap. That shouldn't be. We have to find ways, and, and these are, people are already talking about this and have been for decades. And this, this is part of sacred economics. We have to find ways to uh, bring our values into economic value so that, that if you want to make a lot of money, it's going to be in doing things that uh, protect the environment, that heal ecosystems, um, bioremediation, permaculture, these kind of things. There should be a lot of money in that because those represent where our values are today. And this can be done, uh, for example, by having very high taxes on pollution, on new resource extraction, um, to, to make those activities very expensive and to give an economic incentive to, to activities that don't do that. Um, and that, that kind of resolves this problem today that, that we all experience that, that the things that we really want to do, there's not much money in those. And where the money is, is in things that we don't really want to do very much. Because today we don't really want to participate in the conversion of nature into goods, into product. That's not where our hearts are. And that's different from 100 years ago, when every young person wanted to become a captain of industry. But no, not today. So that's one way. Um, some of the proposals that I describe in the book are more radical. Um, one of them uh, is negative interest, to change the way that money is created. There are lots of ways to, to do it without um, uh, granting a monopoly on money creation to private banks. Um, and I've investigated a bunch of these ways. And the way I like the best is to reverse interest so that um, the way it would work today would be that deposits, bank deposits in the Federal Reserve, bank reserves, would be subject to negative interest uh, or a liquidity tax. And the effect is, and, and so cash would be the same, so if you had a million dollars, then it would be subject to maybe a negative 5% decay rate, whether you kept it as cash or put it in the bank. Um, so you would rather not hold on to that money. You would be happy to lend it in, at zero interest. Uh, let me give you a, a little analogy. So suppose, um, suppose Michael here uh, has um, 200 loaves of bread. And he knows that those loaves of bread are going to go stale in a few days. How does he use those loaves of bread to his advantage? Knowing that if he keeps them all for himself, 
he's just going to end up with a big pile of stale bread. Well, he could give everybody in the room three loaves of bread. Say, and you know, I'm just such a generous guy, I'm just going to give everybody all the bread that they need. And, and they'll remember that my generosity, and when they're hungry someday, when I'm hungry someday, they'll give me bread. Or you might even make a formal arrangement and say, I'll, you know, I'll give you three loaves of bread now, and when I need it, I'll tell you, and you have to give me three loaves of bread. But he wouldn't be able to say, I'm not going to give you any bread unless you agree to give me four loaves of bread back for the three, and if you don't, then I'll sue you. <laughs> Michael can't do that, because you can just say, screw you, you know, you sit on your bread, it's going to go bad. He doesn't have the leverage that the possessors of money have today. And this is how, you know, in, in, in ancient gift cultures, possessions were something of a burden, especially if you were a hunter-gatherer and you were nomadic. Uh, and even if you were uh, a, a, an early farmer, you know, if you had a great year and you had a big granary, you know, full of grain, then it was going to get eaten by rats, it would go moldy, uh, it would decay. And so in order to have status and security, you would want to become a very generous person. And it wasn't just, so it wasn't, giving wasn't just altruism. Maybe, you know, you were also inclined to generosity and you loved the people around you and so forth, but also you knew that if the more you gave, um, the higher your status would be, and also the more people would want to take care of you, too. So everything we associate with wealth, security, status, um, well, those are the two, two main ones, um, and the ability to influence other people, three. Um, all of those things came not from how much you had, but from how much you gave. So how could we, ch but our money system today is the opposite. Power and status accord to those who have the most. And the more you have, then the more you can get. If you have billions of dollars, you can then you're too big to fail and you can invest them in high risk securities. And if they if the risks fail, then you get bailed out and you get more and more and more. Um, and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, so th this idea basically says, okay, let's make money like bread. Let's make money like grain and induce the opposite dynamic so that you can't get richer and richer just by having. But you have to put it to good use. You have to find somebody else who can use it better than you can. So that's, that's another idea that um, is a bit more radical, although there are some main, mainstream stream economists who are working with it a little bit. Um, and it's, it was actually applied in the 1930s um, in uh, Vorgel, Austria. The, uh, and it worked really well. And then it was copied by other towns and uh, cities in America were, were starting to implement it. And then uh, the central governments banned it, basically, because it was a threat to their, to their um, monetary power. Um, but since the 1930s, it hasn't really been used very much. Um, so we don't really know. Um, and the third idea that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, is called, I call it a social dividend. Other people call it uh, a basic income. And it is essentially a uh, regular payment that goes to every citizen of enough money to essentially cover basic living expenses. So it kind of, well, you can look at it on different levels. Um, one effect of it is that it takes away this fundamental insecurity that we all have and allows us uh, to, to express our gifts in ways that may not 
um, earn money, uh, but that are still needed by society. So this touches on the question about what about children, you know, and does this does sacred economics value children? Well, one thing that has not been valued in our economic system is is child care, taking care of children, uh, parenting, uh, motherhood, fatherhood. Um, these are these functions are hard to quantify. Part of what sacred economics is about, it's about changing the things that we quantify and monetizing different things than we monetize today. And that's what the internalization of costs is about. So that that economic activity, the money-making activity will contribute to the general good. But that's only part of it. Changing the money system is part of it. Another part of it is shrinking the money system and giving space to uh, expressions of human creativity that you cannot quantify. Money only works for the things you can quantify. So these, all of these things fit together. So the negative interest economics allows money to circulate without growth because now I'm a bank, say, and I'll lend you a million dollars. You don't have to pay me back two million I'll lend you a million dollars even if you're only going to pay me back the same amount. A zero interest loan is worthwhile because if I keep that million dollars, it's going to decay and be worth $950,000 in a year and so on. And that doesn't mean that the banks don't make money. I'll lend you a million dollars at zero interest because my depositors are depositing it at maybe negative 3% interest, which is better than the negative 5% that they would get if they just kept it as, as, as cash, right? So the system actually works almost the same as it does today. Um, but it allows the system to work in a steady state context or even a degrowth context. And that's important because we need to shrink the realm of money and the um, monetization of all of life in order to give room for these things that we can't quantify but that we actually need for our well-being. Um, modern life has has migrated into the realm of of the quantified, leaving us starving for the intangible things or for the qualitative things. You know, we have we have uh, bigger and bigger houses, but less and less intimacy, less and less public space, less and less interaction, authentic interaction. Uh, we have more and more bites of recorded music, but less and less music that was actually sung to you. You know, if you've been serenaded, you know what I'm talking about. Or, or you know, when you go hear a band and there's that connection with the audience and they're actually speaking to you, they're actually singing to you and playing for you. And there's something, no matter how much you paid for that ticket, you know you've received something more and you become a fan and you want to give something to them in return. Like that's what I'm talking about, this realm of the unquantifiable. And that's, and, and, and anything that's an intimate function involves something of this unquantifiable realm. Uh, beautiful food grown for you, cooked for you, versus calories that you can quantify. There's something that escapes quantification and that nourishes us on a really deep level. So, that, that, that's kind of, that's part of the motivation for a social dividend. Now, some people say, well, if everyone were guaranteed a basic income, then people wouldn't work, right? They wouldn't be motivated to work. That objection basically is saying something, saying something about human nature. It's saying that you don't really want to work. Because really what you're motivated to do is to maximize your reproductive self-interest or your, your economic self-interest, your rational self-interest. That's your nature, it says. So you don't really want to work. So if you didn't have to, you wouldn't. But a different view of human nature that comes from the understanding of the connected self says our purpose for being here is to give of our gifts unto others. And if we're not doing that, then we don't even feel like we're living our own lives. 
and I think probably everybody <laughs> that I'm talking to has experienced this, you know, that, that if you're engaged in an occupation where you're not <clears throat> exercising your gifts, like you have that feeling I'm only doing this because I'm paid to. <clears throat> And people will will become miserable in jobs like that. And the gifts have to be going towards something that you believe in. All of us have that desire within us to give to the world. It's built in because, because we've received so much. We've received birth. Like we didn't earn that. We didn't earn being nursed. We didn't earn uh, having air to breathe and water to drink and this beneficent planet. Um, everything that, that gives us life and joy is a gift. And the natural response to receiving gifts is gratitude, which is the desire to give in turn. So that's built into us. And, that, and so it's a very different view of human nature um, that informs uh, these kind of proposals that I'm talking about. So like the nitty gritty level is related to the big picture level. Uh, so, you know, so, okay, so a social dividend. Um, and then the other objection is, can we afford that? Like, do we, you know, if, like, where's it? I mean, already we're talking about austerity, you know, and, and we don't have enough money to do the things that we once did. And that is something that we really need to examine. Like, why don't we have enough money to do the things that we could easily afford to do in the 1960s? Is it because worker productivity has gone down? No. Is it because our technological level has receded? No. Actually, Worker productivity has gone up, and our technology is capable of things vastly beyond what it was. Why is it then? This problem has, has gone goes back hundreds of years. For hundreds of years, futurists have been saying, "Very soon, we won't have to work very hard." In 1800, they were saying, "A machine can do the work of a thousand men." Therefore, as we develop more and more machines, very soon. Each man will have to work only a thousandth as hard. It was obvious. They were saying that when the computer was invented again. It will do for mental labor what the machine did for physical labor. Alvin Toffler, the futurist, wrote in, the 1980, in 1984, I think he said, he said, by the year 2000, the biggest problem facing society will be what to do with all our leisure time. And he predicted, you know, 20 hour work weeks, uh, and, and, and it hasn't come to pass. In fact, we work harder now than then. And what happened? Really, what happened is that at every turn, we decided to consume more rather than to work less. And that choice was dictated to us by our money system because it demands ever-increasing consumption. But we could instead choose to work less and not consume more. A lot of people are already voluntarily or involuntarily making this choice. Involuntarily, it's called unemployment. We should have so much product, production is useless to human well-being. Uh, electronic billboards, for example, the armament industry, uh, all these people working in in uh, insurance companies, like people, hundreds and hundreds of people, and this, my friend works in this company, and all they do is like this medical billing, you know. Um, so much of our of our activity today goes toward no good purpose. So much of our production is not necessary. Like on my block, every single house has its own stairmaster. Every single house has its own set of power tools. Like we could have a common power tool shed and life wouldn't be worse. Life would be better. You know, um, we can share. And, and these, these are, are developing now, actually, with the Internet, ironically enough. You know, people are developing new ways to share. Um, uh, I just read about a new program in, um, might be in San Francisco, 
in the Bay Area where instead of getting a taxi, you like share rides with people who are going where you're going to go anyway. That's bad for GDP, you know. That means less gas being bought. Maybe it'll mean people buying fewer cars because you can just get a ride. Um, share anytime you share that hurts GDP. So conceive of, so we don't need all this stuff, right? Degrowth would actually make life better because we'd be sharing more, interacting more, um, and and it also means that we don't need to work as hard to make all this stuff. We could we could maybe work like hunter gatherers worked. They they worked about twenty hours a week at subsistence. Anthropology demonstrates this. Um, like, why can't we work as hard as a Stone Age hunter-gatherer? Why do we have to work harder than them? After 5,000 years of technology, like, can't we do better than a Kalahari Bushman in, in you know, using stone tools? Like, come on. So, um... That, so that's that's okay. So that's the social dividend, and I, I think I think I've given you kind of a big picture and uh, of the transition that we're going through uh, from the separate self to the connected self, from uh, the conquest of nature to partnership to the healing of nature, and I think I've also described a few of the ways um, that it translates into economic policies that, that are actually aren't that far away. It doesn't even require sweeping away all of the old institutions and building new ones. Uh, I mean, negative interest just means taking the, the lower bound from zero down to negative something. Um, for, for internalization of costs, it's just a shift of the taxation structure. Uh, for, for the social dividend, it's, I mean, we already do that. It's called a stimulus check. You know, there was a few years ago. Uh, the state of Alaska does it, actually, too. There's an annual payment to every citizen. Um, so these things are not really that radical. But they would profoundly change everything. Um, and, and I just want to, you know, describe how, how they fit in to the um, civilizational transition and, and the, the change in our consciousness that's happening. Uh, because we, we sense that, that the economic crisis is a spiritual crisis, you know, that, that some, in some way everything is at stake and everything is going to change. We, we know that. And so I'm just kind of explaining why, like what we are a part of and um, where we're going and I mean, I could go on for hours and hours, and sometimes I do. I mean, there's another part of the book about how do we personally align with these changes? Um, how can we examine ourselves to find the ways in which we're still living in the story of separation, like I am, in many ways, and I discover them almost daily, and, and, and we can, and this is a community function to help each other uh, live from a different place. So it's... Um, I like to say that action on every level is needed, personal, community, political, global. Um.